So I was at the thrift store recently and I was looking in the electronics section and I found this, a Toshiba laptop for just $5. Now it's got a note saying that it needs a hard drive, but we'll fix that in due time. But in the meantime, I just want to say how shocking it is that I found this for this cheap. It's got, you know, relatively modern specs over here. Windows 7, you know, it's compatible and Core i3 processor, probably the first generation ones, but that's still really good for $5. And even better, I got the charger for it, the actual Toshiba, you know, official charger for just 50 cents. So in total, I ended up paying just $5.50 for electronics. I also got a hardcover book, um, and that would be Heidi. All right, so before we go and clean it up and, and do all that, let's first see if it works. I've plugged it into the charger. Let's try powering it on and seeing what happens. All right, so it seems to have gone to the Toshiba screen and naturally it's not booting to anything because it's missing the hard drive I do have my trusty bootable USB stick with Linux on it though So let's see if that changes anything in that case Let's try turning it off and turning it back on this time holding like I don't know the escape key or something like that Normally, it's like escape or F2 or something like that and it should boot up So we've seemed to have gone to the BIOS screen over here first We can look at the specs. So it's got an Intel Core i3 third generation Wow, that's actually pretty good. And it's got uh, 2.4 gigahertz, okay. And it's got four gigs of RAM, which is surprisingly good. Once again, this is $5 and it's got four gigs of RAM. That's nearly like $1 per gigabyte of RAM. Let's try to change the boot order. So we've got a USB over there. It's the this one, this PNY uh, USB over there. Let's make it the number one. So I think that would be F5, oh no, okay. it's actually F6, okay. And now we're gonna save and exit by doing F10 over here. So exit saving changes. Sure. All right, so we got it working, kind of. Let's see if it boots up. Okay, booted up into the USB. I've got Artix Linux over here, LXDE, so let's see how that runs. Let's just boot it up and see, first of all, if it boots up and then see how it goes. All right, we got to the boot screen. Let's go into the actual system and see how it goes. By the way, it's shocking me that this thing is running this well and doesn't have any cracks or anything terrible. Okay, so we seem to have encountered a problem. Uh, I think I know what this is about though, because this is actually a problem with my USB. All right, so we're back at it again. It's booting up. Uh, I'm going to go into the uh, LXDE version over here, and I'm going to boot it in Grub 2 mode. That seems to make the difference uh, for it. It's just really hard to look at it when it's this dirty. Okay, so it's booting up the system. That's good. We got a pretty good resolution, and it looks like it's 720p or 1366 by 768, one of those weird ones. All right, we got the system booted up. Let's go check out more of the specs. So let's see. First, let's list the block devices. Let's see what it actually has, if it has a hard drive or not. I'm gonna do LSBLK. Okay, so it really doesn't have a hard drive. It's got a DVD drive though, which is I think this one on the side, but it doesn't seem to have a hard drive based off this readout. Let's find out, uh, let's do a NeoFetch and see what that yields. Or actually there's like a different one called FastFetch now. Let's try that. Okay, so it looks like we have, well, obviously Artix Linux, it's a satellite C50A. We have, let's see. Da, 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 da. All right, uh, i3 30, you know, third generation i3 with four cores. Okay, so I'm assuming that's two cores and four threads. We got a, you know, regular Intel, you know, GPU built in. We got the four gigs of RAM over there. And we have no disk, yeah, no, nothing at all. It's only got the USB stick. And surprisingly, the battery is charging, which means a lot. So like if I unplug this, it actually stays on for a little while, which I guess is desirable. Okay, so it seems to be a 47, and then eventually it'll start discharging. So the fact the battery isn't completely fried is a pretty good sign. All right, so that's enough for me to be convinced that this is worthwhile restoring. So let's go and clean it. All right, the first thing I notice is this cover on the camera. Maybe this is like a spy laptop or something used by the FBI, which is why the hard drive is missing. Anyways, I cleaned it with some isopropyl alcohol and a microfiber cloth which is fine for the shell, but you really shouldn't do that on a display. Like I put that note over there. Uh, it can ruin coating on more expensive displays, especially on Macs and things that have really fancy things on them. Here's me peeling off the, the tape with the needs repair note and getting off the rest of the tape residue, which is a little bit hard. Uh, but yeah, just rubbing things with alcohol, as long as you know what surface you're doing it on, should be fine. It didn't have a lot of dust or anything crazy in it. Uh, it was mostly just like a few scuffs and minor things. But besides that, it's basically in perfect cosmetic condition, which is what shocked me a lot. Uh, and here's the final product over there. Yeah.
So at the bottom of the laptop, there's this panel that comes off with a singular screw, mind you, you know, talk about <laughs> repairability. And down here, you have access to the RAM and the non-existent uh, hard disk. So we're gonna replace it with an SSD. Over here, I have this 254, or actually 240 gig SSD from Micron that one of my friends gave me, thank you. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this in the laptop now it doesn't have any screw holes to actually fit directly in like into like a casing but that'll be okay because it's an ssd it's not going to rattle around or do anything weird so i'm going to go ahead and plug it in i think it goes in like this into the sata connector just like that um actually i don't think i got it in quite let me just make sure it's there you go that's better i'm a little bit worried because it's kind of falling down here but overall it should be okay um and now let's see if we can actually get it to install an os on there now we have a usb stick which we can install Debian Linux on. I've loaded up the Debian net install ISO on this, which actually comes pre-installed with Wi-Fi drivers and everything I need to set this up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug it in and we're going to install the OS. So let's just get it plugged in over here and turn the power button on. All right, there we go. We got the first screen on. It's going to start loading into Ventoy and I have Debian over here loaded up. Ventoy is this really cool thing that lets you put ISOs onto USB and load whatever you want. So I'm going to go into that one over there and I'm going to go to, I guess, Grub2 mode is the most reliable and just wait for it to load. All right, so here we have the Debian 12 install screen. We're going to be doing the graphical install. So I'm going to press enter and wait for it to load. All right, here we are the language selection screen. I'm going to click continue down here. It just does all the usual install stuff key map language location all that kind of stuff it's now just setting up the packages all right here's the really cool part now it's going to start setting up the wlp2 so or whatever basically the wi-fi interface and as you can see it's telling me i have a wireless network adapter now this is really cool because if you used to use older versions of debian they actually did not ship with proprietary firmware which you know is an advantage if you don't like it but in this case it actually does come with it which means we can use the wi-fi on our installation disk so i'm going to go over here and click continue and it's I'm going to blur this part out, but it basically lets me see all of my like Wi-Fi networks. I'm just going to go ahead and, and just log in. And the cool part is when you select a network over here and put a password in, it actually lets you keep that password after you've installed the system. So you'll basically reboot from the system and you'll already have everything set up, including Wi-Fi. You won't have to do any setup at all. I've actually forgotten my password. All right, now we go ahead with all the basic, you know, installation stuff after the Wi-Fi. I'm going to go and change the name to Toshiba. That's a pretty good name, I think. <laughs> pretty simple little host name over there. I'm not going to pick a domain name because I don't really need one. But if I was running like an email server or something with reverse DNS or whatever, I probably would want to put one in here. Uh, then it's going to go over to my password. So I'm going to just set a very basic password here for the root account. All right, it's giving me the time zone. I'm in the Eastern time. And now it's going to do the disk partition. So this is the moment of truth. This is where we get to see whether the SSD is actually there or not. We're going to use guided, use entire disk over here. And yeah, there it is. SDA, 240.1 gigabyte Micron M500. So it's certainly in there. Let's go and double click it. I'm going to do all files in one partition since it doesn't, you know, really change anything, especially because I'm probably not going to be reinstalling OSs on this anyway. So I'm going to click that. i am wait for it to load. And there you go. It's giving me all the information for it. That looks pretty good. It's only giving me one gigabyte of swap, but I can always add more virtual swap if I want to. So I'm going to go down and click finish partitioning and write changes to disk and click continue. All right, so now it's going to confirm the changes. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to change it to ext4 and swap. Looks good to me. So I'm going to click yes and click continue. All right, installation's complete over here. Now we can finally click continue and see if it works. But before we do that, we got to make sure we change the boot order. So I'm going to hold down, I think it was F2. I'm not sure. One of those two. So I'm going to hold down F2 and escape or whatever it is that leads me to the BIOS. All right, here we are. Go down to boot and make sure the number one device is Micron. So I think it's F6 to increase it. Yeah, there you go. So number one is the SSD over there. So now we can exit saving changes. All right, so as we can see, it's booting up into Debian. When I turn it on, I'm going to click enter over here and let it boot up and let's see what happens all right it's given me the login screen it's also given me all the different you know tty's and all the usual stuff so now i'm going to go on to configure ssh on it the first thing we got to find out is what the ip address is so if you go over here and go to the terminal and type in ip uh, r which is route it should have automatically connected okay yeah so it's automatically connected to our wi-fi and as you can see it's given it 192.168.1.133 we got to keep note of this number because using that we can access this computer via SSH if we're on the same network as it. All right, so since I recorded that segment, I actually decided to plug it into the Ethernet instead of using Wi-Fi, and so the IP address is different now that I'm connecting it up to the network that way, 
It's now 192.168.1.197. Fantastic. I've also gone through into the SSH settings and enabled root login. That way we don't have to go through the user account. And some people are going to say, oh, that's insecure, that's whatever. As long as you have a secure password and you actually need root access on your system, it's about the same level of security. All right, so now that I have the IP address, I can SSH into the server. To begin with, I'm going to copy over my SSH public key, which you can generate by running SSH-keygen, but I've already done that. So I'm going to do SSH copy dash ID, and then I'm going to do root at 192.168.1.197, which is the local IP address of my server. Now I've already done this, so it's not going to do it because I've already copied over the key, but this allows you to have an easy way to SSH into your server without having to type in a password. Anyways, with that done, let's actually go into the server. I'm going to do SSH root and then the IP address again. And you could even set up an alias for this if you want to. And now that I'm in here, I'm going to open up the Jellyfin documentation and start installing. So this is the Jellyfin documentation for Debian Linux. It just tells you to run this one command. So I'm going to copy paste it and, and put it into here and press enter. Oh, and there's no sudo. Oh, my bad. I should probably install sudo apt install sudo. There you go. That that'll make it a little bit easier. All right. Well, that fixed. I'm going to copy paste this and put it in here and it should automatically set everything up. Uh, Debian, Debian, we're on Debian 12, and yeah, that all looks good. So I'm going to press enter, and it's going to start installing Jellyfin. This might take a little bit because it's downloading FFmpeg libraries and all sorts of stuff that Jellyfin needs from its own repository, and the packages can get a little big. All right, and now that it's done enabling everything, it's already gone up and set up the Jellyfin service, which means it's going to start automatically at boot, and it's already running right now, and it even gave us the IP address to access the server from here. So I'm going to copy this into my browser and start configuring it everything. All right, so I went ahead and went to the address, and we're at the Jellyfin setup screen. Everything here should be pretty straightforward. I'm going to click Next because I want English. I'm going to pick a username. I'm going to name myself Alex, and I'm going to set a, a secure password. I'm going to click Next. And now is the important part, adding my media libraries. Now what I've done is I've set up my family photos, so home videos and photos, um, in the following directory. I put it in backup and then pictures and then photos, just like that. I'm gonna name the folder photos just to keep things simple. And I think the default settings will be fine for this. I'm gonna click okay. And now it's gonna start processing all of those photos. In addition, I can also add my music collection on here, which I've stored in backup music. You can add all sorts of other stuff here, like movies, TV shows, and other things like podcasts, and even books. But I'm done setting up for now, so I'm going to click Next. Region settings look pretty good, so I'm going to click Next. And I'm not going to allow remote connections to the server, because I would prefer not to have those, and if I will set those up, it would be through Nginx and not through Jellyfin itself. I'm going to click Next. And that's it. I can now click finish and it will send me to the Jellyfin login screen. So I'm going to type in my username and my password that I set up earlier. And here we go. As you can see, it's still processing my photos. So I'm going to have to wait a little bit before I can start seeing them all on here. But the basic structure is already showing up. And with that, I've set up a server that allows me to see my home videos and photos. Now, of course, there are a lot more things that you can do with a server besides just doing, you know, home video and media storage. You can do gaming on it, like you could set up a Minecraft a server on this if you really wanted to, or MindTest, which is the open source alternative to, to Minecraft. You could also do more practical things, like if you buy a domain, you could set up your own email server, or maybe even a calendar and agenda server. But I think for now, this is going to be a good application for the small computer. Like I showed at the beginning, it's not the most powerful thing, so maybe it's not a good idea to have it do a ton of different things at once. And sticking to one thing might be the best option here. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video on the Toshiba $5 laptop experience. Uh, I've been Denshi. Goodbye.